Among a wide range of cases from rising nationalism, Russia and China's influence, and disruptive technologies in the rise of a populism creates challenges for democracy. However, additional motivations include the anti-democratic projects led by leaders that lie at the center of global democratic backsliding. Liberal democracies peaked in 2012 with 42 countries and are now down to the lowest levels. Electoral autocracy remains the most common regime type and accommodates 3.4 billion people. In total, autocracies now amount to 70% of the world population, with around 5.4 billion people. Democratic decline is evident particularly in Asia-Pacific, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, as well as in parts of Latin America and the Caribbean, with 20% of its members becoming autocrats between 2011 and 2021. The European Union may be facing its own wave of autocratization. Despite the majority of Europe holding democratic structures and governments, its functions remain stagnant. Since 2022, a total of 17 democratic countries in Europe have encountered deterioration in the last five years. These declines impact 46% of highly persuasive democracies. Europe contains a variety of regime types, with Hungary and Poland prominent for the democratic decline. Hungary has faced the largest decline measured in nations in transit and plummeted to develop into a transitional or hybrid regime. Similarly, Poland remains a semi-consolidated democracy, facing a steeper decline over recent years compared to Hungary, while Serbia displays concerning sides of backsliding. Governments are increasingly utilizing misinformation to sway public opinion both domestically and globally. The Middle East and North Africa region have the highest and most rising levels of government misinformation. A report from 2022 recorded 35 countries that face substantial degeneration in freedom of expression from governments, resulting in an increase from five countries 10 years ago. The persistent influence and rise of authoritarianism in the world challenges the path of democracy and poses a question on how pro-democracy states can promote and take action while many face democratic challenges in their own countries. My colleague Harun Karchic will expand on these matters with Executive Director of Political Capital Institute in Budapest, Peter Kreko. So Peter Kreko, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel and thank you so much for taking time to speak to us. Now, most experts agree that we are witnessing democratic backsliding in the Western Balkans, especially when it comes to media freedom and, and political competition. Why is this happening in certain countries such as Serbia and, and Hungary and, and not as much in others? Hi Harun and thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I will start by saying that Jan Werner Müller a long time ago had an essay that uh, and the title was that Eastern Europe goes south. And it referred to the phenomenon that we can increasingly observe similar tendencies um, in the Eastern European countries, including Hungary, than the ones that we usually attribute to the Western Balkans. So I think increasingly, uh, Hungary is bec becoming a country in the Western Balkans. Um, and I think we see more similarities uh, between Hungary, for example, and Serbia, when it comes to the media system, when it comes to the party system, when it comes to the level of corruption, when it comes to the attitudes towards the West or the attitudes towards the East, uh, we see more similarities between Hungary and Serbia than Hungary and any other EU member states. And when I talk about any other EU member states, I would even say that uh, Croatia, for example, or, or Bulgaria, or Romania, countries that we uh, traditionally say that belong to the Western Balkans, uh, are, have shown more development, I think, in, in uh, democracy-related and institutional aspects than, uh, than Hungary, for example. And I would say that characterizing Hungary as the uh, least democratic country within the European Union at the moment 
is, is a fair assessment, unfortunately. Right. Um, do you believe that this is the consequence of local issues or part of a larger trend of democratic backsliding across the globe? I think Hungary has been an, an early bird of the populist zeitgeist. And uh, we could see a surge of right-wing populism in all over the world, and we can still observe uh, its elements uh, all around. But at the same time, if we take a look at around in the world, we can see that right-wing populists and authoritarian leaders such as Jair Bolsonaro or such as Donald Trump uh, lost elections uh, after the last COVID pandemic. And I think it was slightly connected also uh, to the uh, lack of success of uh, these political leaders to handle the COVID-related situation, and of course, broader economic and other issues. It seems that Orban is much more difficult to be defeated on elections. And last time he he uh, won elections with less than, uh, with more than 50% of the votes. So uh, if we take a long look around in, in Central Eastern Europe, um, and uh, partially in the Western Balkans, we see that in countries like Bulgaria, in countries like Romania, the political developments are, are quite dynamic and you have many subsequent governments changing its, uh, each other. Also in Croatia, you can see uh, political changes. In Central Eastern Europe, we could see that populist politicians like Andrei Babiš have been defeated on elections. So I would say that increasingly, Hungary is the odd one out. Now, three decades of US diplomatic and financial investments in the Western Balkans have contributed to Euro-Atlantic integration and economic growth, but have they not prevented, um, I mean, but they have not prevented state capture, environmental degradation and immigration. Uh, why is that I would that say so? that the European Union has a nature that it is much more able to push the candidate countries the countries that want to become the members of the European Union in the right direction when it comes to institutional changes. So before countries are joining the European Union, you usually see rising level of institutional independence, rising level of um, democratic practices, and also um, a lot of institutional changes, for example, when it comes to stepping up against corruption. But once you're in the club, if you're only the member of the European Union, then nobody is really pushing you into that direction and no one can force you anymore that much to keep the uh, rules, the written and unwritten democratic rules. On the other hand, we can see that uh, waking up to this authoritarian challenge, the institutions of the European Union have made some very uh, very harsh steps in the last few years to freeze funds of countries uh, that are not really keeping up with the uh, democratic standards of the European Union, namely with Poland and with Hungary. And Hungary uh, seems to suffer the biggest because of the uh, frozen EU funds. So what we can observe at the moment is a big stress test for the European Union, if the EU will be able to, uh, to push these countries in a more democratic direction or to somehow facilitate political change in Poland, for example, then I think it will be an important lesson to all the other uh, countries in the uh, eastern side of the European Union that if you misbehave when it comes to, to democracy, then your funds can be frozen. Uh, critics of the European Union used to say, and I think this narrative has uh, particles of truth, that Western European countries that do not really keep up with the democratic standards of the European Union, that sometimes we can mention uh, Italy, for example, uh, we can mention in some uh, aspects Austria and other countries come under much less scrutiny. So one problem, I think, with the rule of law practices and the rule of law conditionality practice of the European Union is that it seems to be more of a tool in the hands of the big Western member states against the new member states. And I think 
I, I generally agree with the, with the principle that if a member state do not comply with the rules of the European Union, then it has to suffer uh, financially. But I think in, in order that all the member states feel, uh, feel, feel that this is a fair process, I think it should be used in some cases against Western member states as well. Right. But I mean, must a new path be forged for the next decade or so? I think there are many lessons to be learned from the transitions in Central and Eastern Europe. And one of the lessons, and I think um, Ivan Krastev and uh, Stephen Holmes uh, well describe it in their book, The Lie That Failed, that uh, many countries that feel that they have to imitate the West, they have to give, be the good pupils of the Western world and just do the institutional reforms that the United States impose on them and the European Union impose on them. So this feeling is a big driver of the uh, resurgence of the populist right in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And in many sense, we can uh, observe this revolution against imitation. As they say, the revolution against the practice that uh, that Central and Eastern Europe and the, the Western Balkans has just to imitate the West. While obviously there are institutional malpractices on the West as well. So I do think that uh, even the European Union and also the United States to a certain extent has to change the, its approach a bit. I think the unidirectional learning mechanisms do not work the same way that they learned before. So uh, countries in Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans want to shape political processes, not just be the subjects of these political processes. And I think in the light of the uh, war again, war of Russia against Ukraine and the whole conflict, Central and Eastern Europe have right now a bigger say in EU foreign policy, for example. So countries like Poland or the Baltic states or Czech Republic have a stronger role in shaping EU responses that are in many cases much more combative towards Russia than many expected before. On the other hand, some other countries that are more dovish and do not really feel the same way as these more hawkish member states do, like Hungary, or probably we can mention Bulgaria as well, or from outside the uh, European Union and NATO, we can uh, also mention Serbia. I think they will be more distant uh, from the West as a result. So I think that the deep, the old divisions of East and West has have been a bit reshaped by the conflict uh, uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine, and the countries that more align with the Western responses, the countries that more align with the more hawkish approach against against Russia and towards Ukraine, and these initiatives are coming from Central Eastern Europe, they feel more of the members of the club. But the countries like Hungary that have a totally different approach, they can feel that they are more marginalized, they are more put on the sideline. But in a general note, I would rather say that um, so far, the uh, aggression of Russia against Ukraine and the subsequent sanctions uh, unified Europe more than divided it. And uh, polls of the ECFR and some other institutions show that the uh, European Union has the stronger self-confidence at the moment. And also European Union member states have better uh, opinion right now on the United States than they had before, for example, during the presidency of Donald Trump or after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But this trust is very fragile. And I think countries that are not members of EU, countries that are not members of NATO can feel more excluded at the moment. And this is definitely something that has to be t tackled. Maybe the uh, European political community is a is a framework that might be capable of of building one more concentric circle of possible uh, members of EU, possible members of NATO. Right. 
Uh, now, Peter, let me ask you a, a, a sort of a theoret theoretical question. Can democratic institutions be turned to exclusionary ends? I mean, do you see this happening in the Balkan region? Absolutely. Generally, we can see that, that democratic institutions are taken over by authoritarian strongmen. And um, the nature of the new autocracies is not necessarily that they are directly, aggressively cracking down on their opponents. Sometimes they do, sometimes not. They can be very successful in just manipulating the information, as it happens in Hungary. If you own the media and you can control the hearts and minds, then you don't really need to apply any violence. This is what uh, Sergei Guriev and Daniel Tresman refer to when they talk about informational autocracies, for example. But the uh, typical strongman of today are the ones who are elected through democratic elections, and then they, uh, then they distort the institutions to an extent that finally it will be almost impossible to defeat them on elections. I would be very curious to see what happens in Turkey. Um, now, some believe that investments from uh, external actors such as China or Gulf countries uh, might improve the economic situation um, in the Western Balkans, but that they bring corruption and hinder um, the EU's influence uh, and reforms in the region. What is your opinion, or opinion on that? I think there are good reasons to be uh, more concerned about investments coming from Russia and China and from authoritarian states, that investments that are coming from democratic states. I would not like to say that investments that are coming from the from democratic countries cannot be corrupt. I would not say that these investments cannot be polluting. I would not say that these investments in some cases cannot be harmful for the recipient countries, but the chance that investments coming from China, for example, or Russia, uh, uh, exploit more the uh, corruption, I think is, is definitely there. So the reason why I think that Russian and Chinese investments can be more dangerous, that if we take a look around in the region, we can see many examples then these investments were tightly bound to certain forms of corruption. We could see it in Montenegro. We could see it in North Macedonia. Uh, we can see right now in Hungary and Serbia, the Budapest-Belgrade railway line, the pet project of, of uh, the uh, Chinese state, of the Hungarian state and the Serbian state. It is built in high secrecy. So in Hungary, for example, the uh, project itself was made confidential for more than a decade. It means that that subcontracts that are uh, are made during the project uh, will not be under the public scrutiny. And in Hungary, for example, we can see who is the main beneficiary in Hungary of this project so far. Lurins Mészáros and one of his companies He's the wealthiest man in Hungary at the moment, with very, very close tie uh, to the prime minister himself. And this is a general pattern. When it comes to um, Russian energy investments, usually there is a higher price that the public has to pay and the higher price that the country has to pay, but there is a surplus on that. In Hungary, it is called the constitutional surplus, which is a, which is a, a label uh, an euphemism on corruption. So uh, that that these these investments have the chance of making the uh, wealthy in the country even wealthier. So the more most important businessmen can be involved, and the most important decision makers can be involved. So these money traps, I think, are is the nature of Russian and Chinese investments. And, and, and the problem with that is that there are usually strings attached. So you can see that how Hungary, a country that, uh, let's say, 10, 12 years ago, uh, was having a quite different foreign policy towards Russia, was practically becoming uh, a tool of Russian foreign policy. And this process was preceded with uh, energy business, with construction business, 
and with some business in the financial sector and so on. And of course, we do not see a direct, obvious causal link, but it's hard not to think that politicians who are personally uh, interested in inviting Russian and Chinese business, because it can make them rich, will be somehow uh, will be somehow entrapped in a in a foreign uh, policy that is uh, about doing favors to Russia and China. And I don't think Hungary is the only example in that respect. We could observe it beforehand in uh, in in Slovakia, for example. We could observe it in Germany as well, where uh, where uh, Gerhard Schröder, ex chancellor ended up in uh, one of the biggest state-owned uh, energy companies uh, of, of Russia, and the list goes on and on. So I, I think there is a good reason to be afraid about uh, Russian and Chinese investments, and especially when it comes to Russia. I think Russia made it crystal clear uh, how it treats dissent in the, uh, in the uh, near abroad, but also I think uh, he made it quite clear in the last years how it uses hybrid weapons against the countries that uh, that it sees that it's uh, growing more distant from them, including Bulgaria, including Czech Republic, uh, including uh, Slovakia, and so on. So I do think that that uh, it's it's important to screen the investments that are coming from these countries, and I do not want to say that all the Russian investments, all the Chinese investments have this political uh, background deals in them, but many of them do, and it's hard to make the separation. Right, and finally, um, what are the effects of um, disinformation on democracy? I mean, why is the cold era notion that more access to information will accelerate the spread of democracy not necessarily true? Brilliant question. I, it's uh, Peter Pomeranza wrote in his, uh, his book, It's Not Propaganda, that, uh, that we had uh, we had a nice philosophy for the free press and it was the marketplace of ideas that the most valuable idea will come to the top it will be the more po most, po most popular and uh, it will bring about the common good if not directly because it allows as democratic elections allows as well bad decisions but you can correct them later but I think the current media space in the Western world and the social media space is anything but a free marketplace of ideas. Uh, this is a highly distorted information environment where you have more money, you can directly convert it to more social media advertisement and higher visibility. When you have more political power, you can just easily buy up uh, media outlets and concentrate your power, as it happened in Russia, as it's happening currently in Hungary, that have obviously become an information autocracy. And then you can turn your political power or economic power to information power totally directly without any uh, real obstacles. Peter Krekor, it's such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much once again and for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Amidst other causes that sustains authoritarianism lies in pro-democratic countries, bolstering authoritative governments from the impact of its engagement. This is seen in the case of Pakistan. Democratic donors such as the UK and US are committed to promoting democracy abroad through humanitarian aid. However, channels of democratic aid create consequences, leaning more towards economic areas of development that regimes benefit from. The Independent Commission for Aid Impact reported that UK programs spent $2.5 billion between 2016 and 2021, but the issues come from the disintegration that has little impact to humanitarian aid. Despite the lack of clear motives behind democratic pursuits, democratic countries continue to tackle ways to avoid negative implications from their engagements. Certain approaches include Western agencies committed to adopting a human rights-based approach to their activities. 
The HRBA framework is adopted from Swedish International Development Agency in putting human rights at the center of activities. Amidst the rise of authoritarianism emerging within countries in pursuit of democracy, the ways of democratic countries' interactions with regimes will determine how far autocracy will occupy nations.